Putting down to budget 2023, what has been the economic framework of the government going into this budget? To decode that, I'm joined by Dr. Arvind Virmani, economist and member of the Niti Aayog. Thank you, Dr. Virmani, and for joining us on CNN News 18. We are in the exciting digital and startup sphere, Dr. Virmani. What are the emerging sectors you feel are being given and need the extra impetus from the government to become economic engines and job generators? Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic has affected everybody. So you need to have some background. So, so the pandemic, we had two waves of pandemic. It affected everybody in this country and everybody across the world. So uh, the, the incomes of uh, all across the board have, have suffered. So the question is, is not that uh, nobody has suffered, uh, but everybody has suffered. So uh, uh, we had a, a good monetary fiscal policy which minimized the effects and my own paper uh, with Bhalla and etc which is published in IMF showed uh, that the effect on poverty was more or less uh, completely neutralized. So, uh, uh, so we, we have to take cognizance of that. Secondly, I do understand, you know, uh, when we had thought, uh, in fact, I, I had predicted a complete normalization by 2022, but it did not happen because of a Ukraine war which nobody predicted you know nobody could predict so that was an additional shock which has postponed the recovery and in some sense uh, you know uh, the the oil prices we we import 70 percent of our oil they have a very strong effect on the economy and this is not now i have uh, dealt with uh, uh, three oil shocks in my career in government so so uh, uh, one is not denying that people have not been affected they have been affected their uh, some real incomes have suffered because of all these shocks uh, now, uh, what is to be done about it, uh, I can only say you, you have to balance, you know. Uh, uh, the, the point is, uh, do you benefit more from growth? Uh, how much of uh, the attention should focus on restoring growth? Uh, there are these forecasts which I, uh, you know, I have made and the this survey uh, makes those. Uh, that uh, I mean, I reiterated them yesterday only after the IMF uh, put out its forecast that this year 7% plus minus 0.5, next year 6.5 plus minus 0.5, which is actually only a slightly better than uh, the, the uh, finance ministry or the CEA's uh, forecast. Now, so one issue will be the growth uh, will begin to be felt. You know, so far people are only feeling the effects of three years of negative shocks and it will take a year, at least a year more, but I'm confident that the growth processes will uh, begin to be felt directly in people's incomes and consumption by the end of the year. So that is one part of it, to make sure that we deal with any further uncertainty, uh, don't uh, let it affect our growth and if possible uh, do things, you know, which have government has talked about and is doing ease of doing business, etc., which promotes perhaps accelerates the growth further. Mm -hmm. so, so that is clearly one uh, part of it. Uh, the second part is you know, when you are in a period of uh, great uncertainty, everybody and, you know, whether it's the markets, whether Indian markets, foreign markets, everybody is saying this is very uncertain world. So when you are in a period of uh, uncertainty, you have to be cautious. You, you can't be, uh, you know, take all kinds of risks. So that also has to be kept in mind. Now, uh, so, so uh, uh, you know, uh, given that, uh, the best thing uh, is generally, I mean, I'm talking generally from my economic knowledge of 50 years, is to, to consolidate, to don't do any wild things. Mm -hmm. So that is the second point I would make. And third, within that, obviously, uh, I, I'm confident, I'm sure, I'm not confident because I don't know what is in the budget, that the government will do, uh, you know, what it thinks is critical for uh, f for the people a as a whole. But we'll have to wait for that and we can discuss it tomorrow. Uh, I really can't say more than that. Absolutely. Of course, we'll have that discussion tomorrow. But uh, Dr. Virmani, what strides do you feel the government has made when it comes to expanding uh, this ambitious plan of expanding the banking sector and credit access to rural India, primarily via the Jandhan and the Mudra Yojanas? So, uh, uh, you know, I am a macroeconomist. I have not done any uh, research on this issue. And generally, I do not uh, uh, talk uh, unless I have uh, deep knowledge of it. But uh, uh, what we do know is that uh, credit to MSMEs has gone up. So uh, rural credit, uh, we also know that agriculture is one of those sectors which has, uh, in some sense, 
uh, uh, of any sector and any set of people has suffered the least uh, from. I'm not saying they're not suffered. I, I started by saying everybody suffered from the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they have suffered the least from the pandemic. And, and you can look at that and see the growth rate in, in agriculture for the last three years and compare it with any other sector. So, so in that sense, uh, uh, you know, the, what will drive the future is the shift in jobs in agricultural areas uh, from uh, uh, in rural areas from agriculture to non-agriculture. My colleague, uh, uh, you know, tells me that uh, that process is continuing. That the proportion of income uh, that uh, rural household derive from non-agricultural income has been going up. Again, that may have been partly disturbed by these three shocks. But the new uh, so what will be that driver? It will be loans to MSMEs. It will be loans to to households who who invest in housing or or offices or, or, or some, you know, uh, what is called structures. So uh, uh, as far as I can see, that credit has started increasing. Now, you won't instantaneously feel the effect of that on, on jobs and, and, and uh, economic activity, mm -hmm. but clearly that recovery is there in the data. And uh, hopefully uh, over the next six months, nine months, you will see its effect in the rural economy. Right. And now in the agriculture sector, you were speaking about the agriculture sector, Dr. Birmani. Doubling farmer income is a key agenda of the Modi government. But now the three farm laws did not take off. Do you feel the government should make another pitch? And what have been the achievements given, the, given that modernization and market linkages in the agriculture sector remain an issue? So uh, you mentioned the farm laws and I cannot help um, express my deep, deep disappointment with my economist colleagues who, who welched on these, who had been supporting this farm uh, laws for uh, reform for uh, 10, 15, 20 years, but when it came to the crunch, they welched. I, I'm sorry to say this publicly, but I have just seen recent research on Indian states and Indian farm reform done uh, research, published research, which shows that, uh, uh, that farmers will lose from uh, this uh, you know, this <laughs> very negative act which uh, mm -hmm. uh, economists who know better have done, uh, who, who supported uh, uh, non-implementation of these forms. This is a research which has been published, uh, which shows that the farmers would have benefited greatly from this reform. And they've even given numbers. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact number, but something like 18% increase in income would have followed from, from the implementation of these type of form laws. It doesn't mean exactly the same wording of the laws, but so so that is one thing. We keep talking about income, but uh, even economists who have supported these laws, uh, when they welch on it, it's very sad, very very sad. Right. Finally, Dr. Virmani, we have seen that the Indian economy is always lauded for having shock absorbers. Uh, decode the fundamentals that push growth even in the wake of COVID and the fluctuations due to the war in Ukraine. What are the factors that continue to push India's growth agenda? So, so each crisis is different. Uh, again, this is something I'm not saying in hindsight, but we d wrote papers in 2020 showing that, that uh, unlike the financial, uh, global financial crisis, which was basically for us in India a demand shock, in the case of uh, pandemic, it would be both a demand and a supply shock. And that's exactly how it has played out. Mm -hmm. Exactly meaning we didn't give all the details, but the overall view we, we did give. So what is the resiliency? Well. It turns out, and that is a bit of a surprise, as, a out, you know, as somebody uh, who was outside the government till two months ago, what the surprise is that what in our uh, so-called think tank or academic papers we had analyzed was more or less uh, what the government did. Now, I don't know whether they read these papers, whether they talked to somebody or what, but unlike, uh, and unlike us, other countries didn't do this thinking and didn't follow. So, so part of it, I, I guess, must be that in some sense we are more open, we are less ideological. You know, it, it seems that even the great countries, I don't want to mention them, but sometimes can be much more ideological. In macroeconomics, in macro management, ideologies don't work when new things happen. So uh, if, if you want to know one factor which is probably uh, helps us is that uh, when it comes to macro management, actually, historically, we have been much less ideological and much more pragmatic. 
Uh, don't get me wrong, non-ideological doesn't mean you don't have to read all the theory and all the empirical evidence is available, mm -hmm. but then do not base your judgment on ideological issues like, uh, you know, uh, 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 anti-regulation or anti-this, anti-that. Uh, you have to be pragmatic. So I think that's what I would say. That is where our resiliency comes from, that in macro management, we've always been quite pragmatic. Thank you, Dr. Birmani, for sharing your perspective. All eyes on the budget uh, tomorrow. Tune in to CNN News 18.